Morning. I swear a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the book club. Still not much to do out here in the outskirts, so we continue to read books. And we continue with Star of the City. There are still many, many, many entries to go. Uh, let's see, Kane officers like three, they have one, they have three, they have three, they have one, they have seven, they have one, they have one, they have one. Okay, so not the worst. We might be able to get through this relatively quickly, but we need to get started. Right now, contracts should be signed on equal terms with the consent of all parties involved, and the officers must fulfill the terms of the contract following the mutual agreement. It is societal boundary that keeps us humans from betraying each other's trust, as we must coexist. Although these principles are rather abstract, they exist to prevent anyone from devising lowly schemes and ensure that each party gets just benefits. The head's rules don't cover every small detail, so you can say this is a necessary addition to fill those gaps. So these guys, accountants, legal advisors, and ever so slightly corrupt. And this is apparently Sans' brother, which is cool. Nice to know that both the brothers are actually extremely cool in their own way, but not a lot to say here. We move on. Notarization is the process of drafting a document to officially certify a deal between two offices in case things happen. A notarial act is fairly powerful. Through these documents, you can verify various facts and secure ex executory force, meaning if one side doesn't carry out their part of the contract, the contract can be enforced on them. There's no need to argue about who is to blame. Notary acts exist to stop unnecessary disputes from occurring, and it's the job of notary public offices like Kane Office to help with that. Oh, and the city is divided into domains. It's similar to how the Svai Association sets territories for policing. It's fair to expect at least one notary public office in every domain. This isn't to say that you can only use the notary public or in your domain. If you can't find a notary public, or if the office isn't functional for whatever reason, you can always go to other domains, though it costs a bit more. A lot of people still choose the latter since they need to get business done in a hurry. Not every notary public office has the same level of professionalism, after all. Case in point, Kane Office. <laughs> Honestly, the concept of Kane Office provides an interesting wrinkle to my fixer game idea because, you know, a public office, these like accountants, lawyers, legal advisors, whatever you might refer to them as, the insurance companies and stuff, that could play into gameplay somehow. It could be done interestingly, or it could be done excessively boringly, so it would be a very difficult, um, you know, thing to balance. But I think, like, it's hard, really, like, how you can make that work gameplay-wise, because at a certain point, you'd basically just be playing Tax Simulator, which... Um, not many people really want. Some people do enjoy that sort of thing, but not a lot of broad appeal there. Maybe the public office um, idea would sort of, like, if you were running a public office in this sense, there'd be, um, like, enforcement work, where it's like, this person broke their contract, or this person hasn't paid, so go deal with it. A sort of a morally grey path that you could take, maybe? And then there's the whole um, uh, cracking down on patents and trying to... Uh, steal secrets of, like, singularities and stuff from corporations and stuff, which could play into it, which could lead you into conflict with much larger factions. There's ideas, there's possibilities. We live in turbulent times when wings are destined to fall behind in the market if they don't respond to patent disputes effectively, big or small. It's one of the reasons patent wars are that much important. Those mega corporations sue one another for patent infringement or accuse one another for stealing their patent. Us small fries can watch the giants clash without getting worrying about getting caught in the crossfire. In fact, we benefit from such conflict. There are unspoken rules that you need to remember to keep your stake in a patent war. One must patent their technology separately for areas outside of the nest or other domain under their jurisdiction. One must avoid admitting to infringement before carefully reviewing the lawsuit. The rights to a technology cannot be protected if its details were publicized through advertisements or such before the patent was registered, etc. Patent wars break out for so many reasons, it'll take a day and a half to list them out. So in the end, the great irony really is that Kane Office were loophole exploiters, parasites, opportunists, well really this is mainly Nemo, Martina and Bada just work for him. But opportunists, loophole finders, parasites, basically, and they basically got what they deserved. Well, not maybe not what they deserved, but it was very um, fitting that yesterday's promise was what did them over in the end. Nemo is hilarious, but he's not a good guy. He's kind of a dick, but he's a very likable guy, so you have to let him off.
As the gears turn, our bodies are put in motion. Thought gears are indispensable for meat gears. The introduction seems terrifying, but thought gears are said to feel much more satisfaction than meat gears do as time passes. Actually, I'm not sure if a thought gear can still think like a human. They say thought gears are honored to be serving their role, but perhaps it's only a made up story told by the worshippers who hadn't completely gone awry, wishing to free themselves of what little guilt they had. The words I sometimes hear aren't heard through my ears. The gear guides my body as it rotates, as if it's entering commands into my brain. Though that matters not, we are able to live thanks to the help of the Thought Gears. We're no longer lost, unable to find a way ahead. Even if there is no path to take, it tells me where to place my next step. Man, these Church of Gears people are interesting, weird, and concerning, all in equal measure. Because Thought Gears... Those people are basically put into, like, non-sentient slavery by that point. They are, they've pretty much had their free will and ability to think taken away to serve as the thinking vessel for the meat gear. And then the meat gear itself pretty much just follows everything the thought gear tells it to do. There's like more brain power and less brain power simultaneously. It's a weird system and it's like, I know I've made this reference before, but it's worth doing it again. It's like the um, those mages in Dragon Age who um, get all their emotions taken away, where it's like, yeah, this is better in some cases, but and they're probably happy with it in their, in the state that they're in because they lack the capacity to be sad about it. But man, you don't really want that. Like, as someone who does have emotions, as someone who does have the ability to think critically and to the full extent of which a brain can think, the idea of subjecting yourself to this is terrifying. It would be fine once you were there, but the thought of losing it all, I think, is more than most people could bear. I would certainly be hesitant. The Index has an arsenal of swords and blades. Most of the prescripts you receive can be solved with a sword too. Hmm, never really thought about why we use swords. Nope, maybe it's because they have this oppressive aura that makes us look serious or something. Each of us uses different types of blades, starting with the ranks of messengers and proxies. The prescripts give personalized swords from a light one-edged sword fit for slicing things quickly to heavy double-edged great swords. They come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, it helps us stand out from each other. As for me, I've got five whole blades. Maybe being speedy helped. It looks like we get swords that fit our traits. Have you seen the swords Hubert's carrying? It looks so heavy, and he swings it like it's nothing. So I guess they never really thought about the weapons. Uh, and the allocation of such in the in the index, because everyone really just kind of got swords, like the, um, if we go back, because it's easy to do, uh, the Priscellates have swords. Yep, I have just went back pretty much to confirm that. Gloria uses blades, I guess, and she has that weird meat grinder ability, which is weird. Uh, you can't see the swords on these two, except you can see Esther's, you can't see Hubert's, but apparently Hubert has a big sword. I, I think it might literally be for image reasons. A sword is clean, and their design is very clean. It's very clean, it's very refined, it's very simple, actually, despite, you know, the ostentatiousness of it. It is just like white, gold. It's gold and neutral colors, as we can see here. White, black, gold. That's it. Very simple, elegant. And it works. There are a number of ranks within the Index. Prosellates, Messengers, and Proxies are as much as I know. Those who have been chosen by the Prescripts will decide whether to become a Prosellate. If they accept it, they will cover their eyes with a blindfold as they serve the role. The blindfold has little symbolic significance. It's to teach the Prosellate to follow the Prescripts regardless of what is happening before their eyes. Usually a group of five to six Prosellates accompany a Proxy, learning the rules of the Index and the role of each rank. If a Priscilla shows a certain level of competence, the Prescripts will assign the role of a messenger or a proxy to them. After being promoted, they are given a blade of their own and they may take off the blindfold. The Prescripts are a predetermined path. There is no point for Priscillas to refuse any. It's still within their choice to decline the Prescripts offer, even though they're free to quit any time. No one knows if the Prescripts will allow it. The Prescripts might order proxies to kill the runaway who abandoned their position, or let it slide, or even give the order to resign first. The Prescripts are truly unpredictable. A lot of use of complicated words beginning with P here, which is pretty standard, I suppose. But yeah, it's funny because it follows, like, even in a situation where, realistically speaking, the people involved do have a choice, they still don't have a choice because that's what the prescripts are all about. It's a predetermined path. It's decided for you. It's already been decided, apparently, an ungodly amount of time in advance. Also, this blindfold shit is fucking stupid. Has little symbolic difference, it's just to teach them to follow the prescripts. I feel like you could do that without literally blinding them, which would surely make the Priscillates less effective in combat because they can't see. Although, it must be said, it doesn't seem to affect them that much, but you have to get promoted before you can take them off. 
And what if you never get promoted? You're just stuck with a blindfold forever. And then by the time you eventually get promoted, you take it off and you're like, actually, I fight better with the blindfold on because I've adapted to it. Very cool idea conceptually, but definitely not logical. And again, nothing is logical about the index, to be honest. Is forging prescripts a violation of rules? The answer is not exactly. It can be written on any kind of paper, and as long as it's stamped with the seal of the index, it'll pass as a real prescript. You will then wonder, wouldn't there be many people who exploit the system with malicious intent? Copying the seal is a complicated process, and not many know how. Even if they overcome those hurdles, they still cannot outsmart the prescripts. The prescripts know all. They can tell whether or not a prescript has been carried out, how it was done, and if someone is delivering fabricated prescripts. An individual sending counterfeit prescripts out of their own volition can ultimately be traced back to the world of prescripts and the city itself. I suppose the prescripts have some generosity for those forgers, as they may remain unpunished unless a prescript ordering it has been issued. The prescripts were already aware that Messenger Yan was giving out false ones, hence the prescript to follow those faked orders. No, that the prescripts know might not be the most appropriate expression. That's the big, like, this is the kick in the teeth that causes Yan to, um, distort, of course, is that his decision to do something of his own volition was not even of his own volition and well, like you know the prescripts were full like yeah we told we wanted you to do that idiot we told you to do it yeah you make your own prescripts we'll tell everyone else to follow them and then it's our will you're just doing what we said which i don't think uh, i mean i actually think too much my point is that i'm not sure if the prescripts necessarily knew exactly what yan was writing and what and like that he was going to do it and like predicted all the outcomes as such I think they knew he was going to start forging them. I think through some means they were aware of this. They either knew he was going to do it or they knew he was doing it. And they told everyone else to go along with it because they knew it would break his will. I don't think they knew what Yan was going to order. I don't think they knew that what Yan was going to order would tie in with their plans. I think they... It, they, whom, I don't know. But I think it was a case of like, look, Yan is going to do this anyway. Let's use this to break him. And that's what they did. Now, that's just a theory. And to be honest, and not a particularly strong theory either. It's just something off the top of my head. But either way, it did cause Yan to break. Leading to a rather disappointing uh, character design, to be honest. That distortion design was kind of lame. And the fact that it took away practically all of Yan's being was kind of dull as well. Because Yan was an interesting personality. I also would have liked to have fought Yan in his normal form, because he was cool and interesting like that, and I just found him less interesting in his boss fight form. The boss fight itself was okay, and the track is fantastic, but I wasn't keen on the distortion. It wasn't like the crying children situation where I initially thought it was shit and then realized it was great. This one was more of a, I don't really like it, but it's okay, I guess. Much less um, exaggerated or severe emotions on that one. Maybe we can talk about that more when we actually get to Yan. I don't know. To be a leader of the Liu, the most crucial element that can make or break a battle is vigor, not the competence or strength of individuals. With vigor, even the weakest creek can carry heavy rocks like a gale blowing up leaves. Therefore, an excellent leader chooses good fixers and then puts vigor into them. Strength or skill alone won't make a good fixer. While those traits do play a role in higher sections, the most important quality is how well the fixer meshes with their leader's combat style. Section 2, the team with Mai and Cecil, consists of careful and level-headed fixers. They go quite well with Director Lowell because of that. Section 1 would clearly be superior in terms of sheer power, but we follow different strategies with pros and cons for each, so a direct comparison won't really tell much about our actual performance in the field. So I quite like that idea, I guess, really conceptually, where it's like, when picking uh, fixes for Section 2 and Section 1 in the Leo, they weren't necessarily going with, alright, who's the toughest, who's the best fighter, it's more like, who works best with how we fight? Who? And who has like that sort of determination, that inner strength, that stamina, that fortitude to do what needs to be done? Rather than just being really good with a sword, I guess, even though most higher level Liu members don't use weapons. I guess Lowell and um, uh, uh, Zhao do, but Miris, Chun, Cecil and Mai don't. So you, you go from using weapons to not using weapons to using weapons. Now, of course, they've got all those augmentations that make their unarmed combat abilities basically as good as using weapons, and we've seen it in the effectiveness of their fighting styles. But it's an interesting, like, style of progression. Like, the Index had blindfolds to not blindfolds, and these guys have weapons to not weapons to weapons. 
It does make sense in a way, but it is quite bizarre. Director Zhao liked to emphasize something. A mercenary's work is to deceive, to fool the enemy into believing that we are advancing when we defend, to make the enemy believe we will thrust from the front when we strike from above, feign submission when you raise your claws. We must seem unable, when able, to attack, that the enemy may grow arrogant. When the enemy is roused, distract them through disturbance. Be aware that we ourselves are not subject to such anger. In order to defeat the enemy, we must be roused to anger, to remember that one's emotions must remain a means to motivate the body and not the ends, and to exploit the enemy's wrath with this in mind. Our director may be seized with anger and momentarily stray onto un inadvisable paths sometimes, but even the whitest jade has a flaw. I trust her to set herself back on the right track in no time. Ah, uh, yeah, about that. So, to the surprise of no one, a lot of, um... The mentality of the lure section of like just lure members in general stems from the art of war, from Sun Tzu's art of war. And then a lot of it comes down to emotional balance as well, harmony. You know what? It all works very well and it's all very cool. We didn't get a lot out of Miris other than his attempts or hit, perhaps him helping Zhao to not distort at the last minute. But he seemed alright. I preferred Chun, to be honest. Kind of sad that Chun died first, but that's kind of how the game runs things, where it's like, here's the cool guy, he's fucking dead. <laughs> because he was, you know, it's the classic like, oh, here's your new protagonist, and he's dead. Here's another team, and here's their protagonist, and they're dead. And we just keep the cycle going. Right now, Nest L is practically a war zone, with all the associations, syndicates, and fixers at each other's throats. On top of that, the distortions are making things worse for associations and the residents of the Nest. According to the report from the powers up above, there are three major factions of note currently remaining in the Nest. The Index, R Corp, and the Blue Reverberation and his group. R Corp seems to be eliminating threats as per request from another wing, similar to what the Lure is doing. The Index appears to have been guided here by the prescripts. After all, they gladly obeyed, obeyed the people of paper telling them to kill every member of the thumb in the nest. As a result, pretty much every thumb crook and the sub syndicate subsidiaries that were in this place are goners. Even the underboss who was supposed to lead them kicked the bucket, so you can guess how it went. Yeah, so L Corp, the L Corp nest was a fucking war zone during this time. And we were pretty much responsible for destroying most of these factions. Like, yeah, the Index destroyed most of the Thumb, but we took out their leaders. But not a lot to say there other than, yes, L Corp Nest was uh, a war zone at this time. Near enough. Ego, the weapon that corresponds to the mind of its wielder. The sword Carmen gave me was extracted from someone by chance. Giant's eyeballs were attached to the sword, adorned with crimson chunks of flesh. They watched my every move, almost to the point of making me feel a bit uncomfortable. Wondering if this was a product of some new singularity, I asked Carmen what the thing was. She only said that I'll have to get used to it, since there's nothing- there's little she can do about how it looks. Although it looked a bit creepy, it wasn't anything unbearable, and Carmen didn't seem to mind it as long as there were experiments to be performed with it. She added that I have to be careful with it, as it was thanks to sheer luck that the ego could be extracted at all in its unstable state. I had a plethora of experience handling various workshop products, so I decided to take the sword without much hesitation. Fuck, this is a long one. Oh my god, this is a long one. When I first had the sword in my grip, I didn't feel anything in particular. All I could tell is that it's just a big, heavy greatsword. Nothing out of the ordinary other than its appearance. But when I held the sword a few days later to protect a co-worker of mine, I heard a voice. It was the voice of someone desperately yearning for something. Unfortunately, the meaning of that voice was lost on me. Rather, it wasn't even human speech, an awkward sound mimicking somebody. Noises of teeth grinding, bones crackling, mingling with flesh. Some things collide, fall apart, and mix in irregular patterns as if to mimic the way human speak. However, that sound was too violent and sharp, the strong obsession of an empty one. Attachment, void, I'm not sure what word I should use to define this. One thing I understood was that only I could hear that voice, and that it rang in my head rather than my ears. The stronger and clearer my aim to protect someone became, the louder the noise in my head got. Anxious that my mind might be consumed by the voice if I let it weaken my will, I tried my best to pretend that I didn't hear it. The eyes on the blade carefully observed me as I fought the voice in my head. The piercing gaze persisted as if to replace me if I faltered for even a second. It made me feel hazy sometimes. The voice was only a bunch of grinding noises at the beginning, but it slowly learned to speak over time. Soon enough, it started speaking in a language that I could understand. Though it stammered a bit, it takes human hide to protect human flesh. A shell. It kept asking for a shell. I couldn't stop the voice, so the most I could do was ignore it. Even though there was danger in using it, its power was formidable. With it, I protected many a person and cut down many a threat. The voice became stronger and deeper with the more blood the blade drank. One day, it asked a sharp question. Don't you desire a human shell as well? 
When I think back on it, the question might not have been aimed at me specifically, it would only say whatever it wanted to say. It wouldn't try to convince or allure me, all it uttered was monologue. Yet I was frozen stiff when I heard that. It kept saying something, are our lives really worth the blood I spilt for them? It wasn't actually capable of forming such detailed sentences, but my head took it that way for some reason. Maybe I was thinking to myself. I denied its claim at the start. I'd never provoked anyone first. I'd only acted to protect others from an approaching danger. But I felt a small part of myself waver from what the voice said. What will remain when I keep washing away blood with blood? A blood-stained shell would be all that is left. I collapsed for a moment, but I didn't stop thinking. If I broke down, I might be in danger as Carmen warmed. Carmen, right. Carmen would have been different. Nothing could possibly beat the glitter in her eyes that shines as she pioneers a new path. Those honest, virtuous eyes. Even when someone jeered at her speech, even when everyone despaired in the face of an obstacle that brought progress to a halt, Carmen never stops looking after others. She would always take the initiative to lead all of them. If I can protect a person like that, maybe this place will change. Yes, as long as I can protect that one person. As my thoughts became clearer, I couldn't just sit down. My body acted before my head could decide what to do. I don't exactly remember what happened then. When I finally took a grip on my rationality in a vast mindscape and came back to my senses, my body was burning hot. Is this rage? Have I been taken over to the point where I can't even see ahead? But I felt so calm, refreshed even. My head was kept cool, while my heart leading the body was aflame. It wasn't long until I felt something that was different. On solid armor, there was a layer of something tough and dense, but it wasn't fabric. A veil of mist was covering me. Astonished, I moved around and shook my limbs several times, and the veil dissipated soon after. When Carmen learned of this, she didn't say much. She didn't make a big fuss about it or suggest trying something with it right away. She only said that wielding this power is more important than simply manifesting it, so I shouldn't be lazy. She went back to work after leaving that peculiar piece of advice. Maybe she didn't want me to feel too pressured. As more time passed, I could use the armor for longer and eventually got to draw out its full power. I had a weapon and armor that resonate with my emotions. Using them, I could protect more people and I was able to draw forth more durability and strength. The researchers seemed to be struggling to make progress with their work, but it was all right. I believed in them to make it through and I just had to be quicker to do my job in the meantime. However, not long after, the incident happened all too suddenly. No, maybe it wasn't so sudden. The sign was there. Just around this corner, I can hear a child crying. She's sitting in front of a door. One of the two children Carmen took in died in a failed experiment. Unlike Lisa, who was wary and reluctant to open up to us, Enoch showed interest in our research and volunteered to be a test subject the other day. Enoch's speech was so concise and on point. Everyone was shocked. He wasn't afraid, and he wasn't shaking. His voice was unswerving and gentle. Enoch's eyes weren't those of a naive little kid. His words and thoughts were surprisingly deep and mature. Even I was astonished. I sometimes wondered what made this kid have such thoughts. His eyes seemed to have already seen so much of this world's despair and misfortune. However, it was still no reason to allow a kid to participate in the experiments. Carmen spent several nights agonizing over the matter. The experiment was authorized at last, though I didn't want to know what they thought of it anymore. What were they going to do, holding the hand of that little kid? I had to wonder if we were that desperate, but I shrugged it off. I wasn't one to stop him from doing what he chose to do. You should have been the one to die. The other kid, who is now all alone, mumbled, crying. Her words had no weight to it. She probably spouted what she didn't sincerely mean, because the situation was too much for her. Yeah, I, I should have died. Carmen's answer, on the other hand, was likely sincere. Everyone stood still. A crack appeared in our minds which we never thought would crumble. Maybe we all expected it to happen deep down. Carmen's state worsened with each passing day, like a rusting nail. The sunny eyes of the woman who had brought us together were now cloudy, and she spoke less and less. Her voice was lifeless, and she had gotten so cold. It wouldn't have come to anyone's surprise if she died at any moment. She didn't bother trying to look okay. I think it was better that way. Everybody in the laboratory felt constraint in her presence. They viewed Carmen in different ways. Reproachful looks of those resenting her for bringing them this far, only to let go of her responsibility. Concerned looks of those worried that something might happen to her, and I guess there were some who had no thoughts. The research went on quietly, but not for long. A few days later, Carmen spilled out all of the guilt within her and plunged into it, never to come back up. Except she's kind of still alive or something, but might be, but might not be, it's not really clear. But yeah, wow, that was a long one, fucking hell. Uh, yeah, but more details on the Red Mist is always cool, and how uh, Geb manifested her ego, because we never really got details on what the fuck her version of Mimicry was, or how it functions, or why she manifests armor. In fact, we still don't really know why she- I guess it's part of- it, it raises questions. Really, because like- People needed light to manifest ego. It was it was the dark, bright white nights and dark days that allow people to actually manifest this shit. This sword is a, a 
prototype ego weapon given to Geb by Carmen, but, well, I should say Callie, actually, because that's the period of time in which it's given to her. But the point is, she didn't have... Or did she have light? Did she just happen to be one of the few people who could innately manifest ego given the right circumstances, or a channeling, a focus? Maybe the sword acted as a focus for the light that Kali had, and given to anyone, the sword could have allowed anyone to channel, to manifest ego, to channel their light. And perhaps this was the beginning of uh, Carmen's research into giving everyone light so everyone can manifest ego. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there are details confirming this stuff, but I can't remember every single detail right now, so I'm working with information off the top of my head. But it seems logical. It was an experiment that turned out to be a rollicking success because it literally turned Geb into a color fixer, and Geb was already pretty strong before having a manifested ego weapon, so, and armor, so, yeah, it worked out quite well. Every team in the fourth pack has its own characteristics. Our personalities, powers, and strengths vary so greatly that it's hard to imagine us working together. Nonetheless, we move in packs for most missions. The reindeer team utilizes powerful electric waves generated from brain waves. You see these horns? The electric stimuli generated in the reindeer's brain are condensed at the tip of these horns. The concentrated energy is then collected by our staves for attacks. There's one thing we should be careful of when we use this ability. If the battle drags on for too long or we exert too much power at once, most reindeer will go insane. The symptoms are expressed in various ways, but in most cases they hurt their own comrades or damage the psyches of others. We sometimes utilize K-Corp singularities to protect our sanity or mitigate the mental damage, although we can't afford to use it often. It makes me wonder, I guess, I just had an idle thought. Is there any connection between the, you know, R Corp reindeer soldiers and um, Rudolta of the Slay? Because it's both reindeer-themed shit that is very much focused on mental damage. Rudolta is huge on mental damage. He's all about that shit. He parades through your facility spewing out white damage everywhere. He's kind of a pain in the ass, actually, and he's creepy as fuck. Could, perchance, have Rudolta come from a reindeer team member? Could that have been how that um, abnormality came into being? I don't know. I don't think there's any information to back that up unless um, Rudolph actually has something in his key page that blows it wide open. Maybe a Rudolph clone became Rudolta. It's a possibility. I once again doubt there's going to be any information to back that up, but it could be a thing. Every team in the fourth pack has its own character. Our personalities, powers, and strengths are all wildly different, but we still do most of our missions in packs. Us rhinos specialize in using physical strength. We're good at pushing ahead, if nothing else. I think we're the strongest team in the fourth pack. Smash them hard, block them hard. We often stand on the front lines instead of the frail rabbits and reindeer. The rhino team's armor is thick and large, and we got tough bodies too. Sometimes though, my body starts heating up if I keep moving around, and I can't control myself for a while. I figure that's because of the old odd tech R Corp uses. Something about expanding muscles and pumping more adrenaline into the blood. That's what they told me. Oh, and in case you're wondering, this ain't a singularity or anything. Plenty of others are making use of it, apparently. We never got to hear the deets. We do hear often that we gotta watch out, though. The runner team's got more destructive power than others, and once one of us starts getting all excited and enters a rampage, it won't be easy to stop them until they calm down. Which is why Rhino Team were not deployed to Lobotomy Corporation, because there was a lot of very expensive equipment and also very breakable abnormality containment facilities that um, we could really do with the Rhinos not destroying. Plus, we didn't, like, you know, uh, Angela only ever had to reset the script because of variables that she very much had control over. Barring, you know, the player playing as a... Um, sorting out the days and stuff, it wouldn't be great to um, knowingly and willingly introduce an unknown variable like the Rhino team to um, potentially damage the facility and force a day one restart because the facility has been damaged too much to continue the process of collecting energy. That could be a problem. Every team in the fourth pack has its own caricature. You'd think that we'll never get along with each other, having such different personalities and powers and strengths, yeah? Surprisingly enough, we hunt in packs, for most operations, despite our differences. The Lapin O Rabbit team is generally seen as a distracted and raving bunch. Maybe it's because most of us are nimble, but that also means we handle our missions quickly and with certainty. Our method is the cleanest, actually. Uh, if I had to admit a teensy little problem with us, it's that we don't discriminate enemies from civilians. We do have a tendency to shoot first at any non-rabbit in the area that comes into our sight. We'll leave ourselves open for attacks if we take our sweet time to tell them apart. So we've got to strike first, but hey, we don't leave any troubles behind that way, so what's good is good, yeah? Explains a lot, explains why they would mow down your fucking staff members in Lobcorp. Very annoying, but to be honest, I never really suffered from that issue. Because whenever I use, like, if I was to use the rabbit team, I rarely used it 
as a spur of the moment thing where I'm like, fuck, just get Rabbit Team down there right now. I would typically plan ahead with it. So it's like, okay, I'm gonna need Rabbit Team. So I'd get all of my employees to evacuate that, um, that apartment. And then there'd be an abnormality wandering around like, where is everyone? And then like 20 rabbits would flood in to gun it down. Works quite well, actually. It's a very good strategy, but, um, you know, costs energy and it only works once. So, eh. Good against Bina, though. Our Corp is particularly famous as a private military company. No matter how many combatants die in battle, we fill the vacancy with new soldiers in no time. It was natural for the wings giving us requests to wonder what kind of singularity we have to pump out so many mercenaries in such a short time frame. Besides, our soldiers weren't lacking in combat prowess by any means, so there had to be more to us than just hiring many people. The mercenaries of our corp don't fear death in the first place. They don't hesitate to carry out any tasks. We're big in numbers, casualties are replaced quickly, and we fearlessly proceed and get the job done. Our Corp's mercs were ideal for outskirts explorations and other dangerous operations. How could such a feat be possible then? People started making guesses. There has to be only one answer. They must be cloning people. No, they gotta be robots. Our Corp has been developing war machines in secret. Won't the head arrest them if they tried to clone humans? That's a good point. At the end of the day, people just laughed it off, talking about how nonsensical their, hypo their hypotheses were and how secretive singularities are. Maybe they had the right answer, though they missed the mark a bit. It's true that our Corp uses cloning technology. For that, we had to make a promise with the head. No more than one of the same person should exist in the city for longer than seven days. The first half I can understand, but I'm still not sure why they set a, a limit on how long. Is it related to some ethic we aren't aware of? Oh no, we don't just clone humans and call it a day. We select the fittest one among them. Inside the hatchery, dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of them fight to the death. We have to kill the clones that look just like us, eat them, and prevail. The larger the population is, and the more time given, the finer a clone is made. And the scariest part of it all is finding myself beginning to think this way. Think about it, is it really an admirable trait to have no fear of death? I have to disagree, when you know that you'll die someday, you don't put off your duties forever. You're bound to pick them up even if you rest for a day or two, and when your life is at stake, you try all kinds of things to stay alive. That's when people feel that they're alive. Maybe I said people guess our secret right because our lives are much different from a machine's. One thing I'm afraid of is the hell of a selection game. As time passed, my fear of it changed to weariness. Is this the real life? That is an interesting point raised up there though, right? Like the um, promise to the head, no more than one of the same person, that makes sense, should exist in the city for longer than seven days. So you can have duplicates for a week, basically. And like, you could look into, you could try and figure out like the the narrative reasons, the context reasons that the head would allow this or that like this would be a thing. But let's be honest. Let's actually be honest with ourselves. It was so they could, you know, bring them back. But like no more than one of the same person should exist in the city for longer than seven days, which makes me wonder. It really makes me wonder why they didn't literally have um, R Corp 2 just be, you know, five Mios, five... Um, Rudolphs, five Maxims, five Nikolais, and then all four of them together. Would that be dumb? Yes. Would it be hard? Yes. But it kind of felt like that's where you'd be going and with, with that kind of rule. If you're going to establish that, it's like, oh, okay, so they can, they can do it. They just have to get rid of them afterwards. Which, of course, would be a terrible idea because you think the surviving clones would be so willing to just allow themselves to be destroyed. Although, you know, they just throw them back in the hatchery and say, all right, all of you fight and the one who wins comes out. So, yeah, no, that'd be pretty simple, actually. But it feels, I feel like it, it purely exists just to have people be like, well, why don't they do this? And then go because of that. Literally, that's why. The L Corp that came before Lobotomy Corporation imposed unfair conditions, and many wings weren't happy about it. There's W Corp, which had to raise admission fees and get less trains running because of the energy deficiency. Also, F Corp, which wanted to experiment with fairies to use them in various ways, but failed to produce satisfactory results because they didn't get enough energy. And many other wings had a thing or two to say about the older L Corp, but they didn't have the gall to say it out loud. There weren't many alternatives that could provide such huge amounts of energy. These conditions soon became a hot topic among wing employees and seat folks in general. Who's going to be the next one to change that miserly L Corp? Then someone next to him would say, who has the courage to do that? We all know that'll lead to a war between wings. No choice but to live like this. Though there was another reason to do something about that L Corp, it produced a massive amount of fumes. At first it was thought to be a kind of smoke that's no different from what factories chug out, 
But over time, people realized that this was affecting the residents around it negatively. Some people would suddenly start wishing for the happiness of some others, and still others would spend most of their time staring off into space. What's more, people had signs of sicknesses all over their bodies, and they started wandering around Elcorp's nest. It was like they were returning to their hometown or something. One day, some rich person visited us and said that a war will break out soon. He said we'll get some benefits if we helped her. That gave us a bigger thing to worry about than an upcoming destruction. A war is about to happen? Nikolai collected her thoughts and calmly asked why a war was going to occur. That person paused for a bit and then spoke in a languid tone. I was creeped out by how she said it like it was no big deal. When, one's person, when one person's pure ambition and another's tragic obsession join together, a dream is destined to be born. Ah, I can't remember which... Um additional material it is that covers the smoke wars. I think it's Leviathan that covers the smoke wars. I haven't read it. I don't know. So my ability to comment on this is limited. I imagine the identity of this person who approached Dark Orb is probably revealed in Leviathan. So not much point conjecturing over that. And I imagine the identity of the L Corp that came before the Bombing Corporation is also touched upon in Leviathan. So there's not much point thinking about that. Not really a lot I can say here because the last time I conjectured about something that was in um, supplementary material I hadn't checked out yet, everyone just complained that I hadn't checked it out yet, so I think we'll just move on. Long ago, there was a battle between huge syndicates. I won't bother saying when. Those kinds of things happen all the time in the back streets, and I had the misfortune of getting caught up in the middle of one. The fight was so fierce and intimidating, the young little Mio had to shiver in a corner. I couldn't find a gap to run through, and there weren't any hiding spots around me either. All I did was crawl to a wall, crouch into a ball, and pray that no eyes fall upon me. Stupid, wasn't I? My prayers didn't work. A syndicate member spotted me, and I closed my eyes tight, thinking this was the end. When I took a short breath in, I heard the sound of a sword cutting through flesh, followed by the sound of a person collapsing to the floor. I thought swords like that would hurt a lot, but I felt pretty okay. The situation was so surreal, I was starting to believe that I didn't feel my body hit the floor because a person's senses are dulled moments before death. Then I realized I was staying conscious for too long for someone that just got cut with a sword. I mustered up the courage to open my eyes. I've got to see what's going on at least, you know what I mean? I slowly opened my eyes to a scene I'll never forget, a person covered in red massacring all the syndicate members in front of me. She was literally chopping them up with her massive blade and they were helpless against it. I was looking at it in awe, I didn't even think to check my body. Thud. With the last syndicate member down, the street was open. She looked around, turned to see me, and wow, my face would have looked so dumb, I don't even want to remember that. Anyway, she pointed at an alleyway with that weird sword of hers and told me that I'll be able to save myself if I ran that way and that the rest is up to me. Instead of thanks, all that got out of my mouth was a stupid mumble like, uh, I leaned on a wall and barely stood up with shaky legs. I need to run before more people come this way, but I was so terrified. Even the person who saved me, she was red all the way and looked so scary. While I was dithering, she sighed at me and approached me. Did I frustrate her? Is she going to kill me now? Was my savior an impatient and ill-tempered freak after all? I collapsed on the floor. I mean, think about it, a scary humanoid thing, fully covered in armor, walking towards you with a great sword decorated with red flesh. It was a miracle I didn't faint on the spot. She grabbed my arm, set me upright, and said in a dry voice, It's not the strong who survive, it's the survivors who are strong. Then she shoved my back, and I started running before I could thank her. I didn't look back once. I was so embarrassed comparing myself to her. Ever since that day, I trained myself, aspiring to become like the hero that saved me that day and landed a job at R Corp. I wanted to become a hero myself and save the lives of others. What I wanted more than anything, though, was to meet that person once more. Our corp participated in most large battles in the city, so I expected to see her someday. I thought she'd have been alive all, all along since she was tough. I was going to thank her and show her how much stronger I had gone since then if I didn't get to see her again. But I, well, yeah, I couldn't tell her. Not just because I never saw the Red Mist again, or Gebra, as she is called now. We did meet, uh, meet each other again after a long time, but that's another story. I wouldn't have been able to say it even if I met the Red Mist when she was alive and well. I got embarrassed of myself again. I thought I'd saved everyone, but after all, what I've been doing is far from being a hero. Hey, what do you think a hero is? So yeah, this just gives context to why Mio uh, fangirls over Geb so much, which is understandable. And the, you know, survivors line, which is really good as well. That was a fairly lengthy passage about Mio, and yet still, to be honest, I'd like to know more about Mio. I like Mio. She's a cool character. I like her a lot. Fighting style is awesome. She herself is very cool. The glowing eyes stuff is fantastic. Mio is great. Wish we'd get more of this. I guess Mio is still alive. Yeah. There'd be two Mios. There's two Mios now. Because we collected two books. We killed two Mios, which means there are two Mios in the city now. Ah, that's interesting. Are they still part of our corp? 
I'm pretty sure the fourth pack got shut down. Maybe it's not too late for Mio to become a hero, huh? It's possible. Maybe she'll keep working with Nikolai, Maxim, and Rudolph, or maybe she'll go off and do her own thing. Maybe she'll become a color fixer. That'd be cool. Who knows? Interesting. In the past, the fourth pack was considered a thorn in the side of Arcorp. In other words, we were a headache that they couldn't find a good enough excuse to remove, which was frankly understandable as we were a total foul up of an army at the time, and it took a considerable amount of time for us to improve to our current state. The Rhino team, powerful, but easily agitated and used its strengths to destroy everything all too often. The Reindeer team, prone to suffer a nervous breakdown in prolonged battles, causing damage to its allies. And the Rabbit team, their thirst for blood leaves no margin for sloppiness at the cost of killing civilians. To put it in the nicest way possible, they had a unique niche only they could fill, and as a matter of fact, bringing them to orthodox battles would do more harm than good. Not so long after, I received the news that they were d planning to destroy our pack. Perhaps they deemed it a waste to spend any more energy on us. The news of destruction didn't come off as much of a surprise as I'd expected, or maybe I was so panicked that my hair had turned white. There wasn't much I could say. What more can I say to this person who isn't even a part of our corp? All I can do is humbly accept my fate. The guest, who had an impressive pair of red eyes and dashing brown hair, looked at me and gently smiled. Her demeanor took a sharp, cold turn. I wouldn't have been able to tell that this person had a, a talkative and light-hired side if I hadn't seen her speak moments ago. After a moment of silence, she slowly opened her mouth. A large-scale war was about to occur. If we made big enough contributions in that war, we might be able to avoid being destroyed. That wasn't a suggestion or a plea for help, it was a semi-mandatory request. The reward? We get to avoid termination. Her attitude was something else. The way she confidently delivered her speech in front of me gave off a certain sense of conviction. It was as if she was saying... She was saying she's going to make the war happen. Baffled, I let out a bout of laughter. I knew we weren't in a position to refuse it. And she was right. A huge war broke out soon after. Thick smoke covered that nest. So yeah, the fourth pack have been in uh, our corpse bad books for a long time, which is surprising because they are very good. I think someone actually said, hey, Foreman, you'll, you will soon read a passage mentioning a woman with brown hair and red eyes, and it's not who you think it is. So... I'm just not going to conjecture on that. I don't know. I assume it's the lady... It's just, maybe it's something from Leviathan. Maybe it's the lady from Distortion Detective. I don't fucking know. I haven't read them. So, it's moot. We move on because I have nothing to discuss here. <laughs> I've expressed all of my thoughts on Arcorp at this point. Now, this entry, I actually kind of wish I'd read during the series because it might have provided some interesting context. If you're reading this book, it must mean there's something you want to know about me. I'm sure you have lots of questions, but I sadly can't give out detailed answers. It's hard to come up with a definition and explanation for a power that naturally emerged, you see. How should I put it in that case? I can travel through time and space and see a myriad of possibilities, too many for you to possibly fathom. It's probably a little different from time travel as you commonly imagine it. The future self who experienced a certain past returns to it in order to change the future. Whatever is going on in the past, some kind of paradox is bound to happen to causality. Big or small, little things can set off massive twists, like the flap of a butterfly's wings causing a tornado, and even if I'm afraid of bearing that risk, it could turn into a cycle of meaningless struggles. Yeah, I guess it's fair to say that I travel to a completely different space. Ever thought about the possibility that an infinity of different versions of the world you live in might exist? Let's say that you were sidetracked on your way home and were killed by some syndicate members that ambushed you, but in another world you might have decided you want to go straight home and the assault would have never have happened. Or you might have noticed syndicate members as soon as you stepped into the wrong alley and quickly got back on track. Those small choices can add up and result in countless worlds where countless outcomes unfold. I know what you're thinking. This isn't logic that can realistically be proven. I know all of this sounds unbelievable. People can't understand me because of that, and I, I even I have difficulty explaining myself. I made it sound grandiose, but this power isn't almighty by any means, so I try not to use it carelessly. Not that I expect you to care for such details. It's already complicated as it, enough as it is, isn't it? Just know that this power isn't omnipotent. No power is conveniently given to you in this world, after all. There's always a price you need to pay, and there is a world I yearn to reach, no matter that price. I'm doing this so I can find the world where I can see that possibility. And in the many worlds I've been to while doing this job, I've so I saw many people who were lost after losing their precious stuff, just like me. I couldn't just pass them by. They looked so p miserable and pitiful. Well, it wasn't entirely out of goodwill. The fact that they were worth helping played a big part. Once again, nothing in this world is free. I didn't quite pity them as much as I weighed up the favors they could give me in return. And thanks to that, I've become acquainted with quite a few fixers. And as corny as it is to say this myself, some even started calling me their mentor and became my devo devoted admirers. Lots of people ask me what I'm going to such great lengths to see. A leading figure that commands powerful fixers who are on, level of a, on the level of a color? I don't know. 
All I want is to meet my son, whom I had to part with in the most unfortunate way, meaning I don't care about the ancillary stuff. I can see it so faintly. It almost seems to be within my reach, but it always ends up being a mirage. So of course, the downside to the Purple Tears ability is that there are so many fucking realities, so many potential realities, that it almost doesn't matter. It's almost a detriment that she can see them, because accurately predicting something through that fucking mess is borderline impossible. Because let's take her example as an example. The person who, on their way home, was killed by uh, Syndicate members. But then there's an alternate reality where, say, they... Didn't, they didn't dawdle around or whatever, went straight home and missed the Syndicate members, or they noticed them there and then backed out and didn't get killed. Now, there's a reality where the person was killed, and then in that same reality there are infinitely branching realities where someone might walk down the street at a specific moment, or they might not, or a train might go at a specific time, or it might be late, or someone might eat a cheeseburger, or they might have a bacon sandwich, or they might skip dinner, or there might be another reality in which a mouse scurries across the road, and in another reality someone steps on the mouse, and then you have to consider all these different realities that I just said, branching from the reality in which the person is actually not killed by the fixers, or the syndicate members, sorry, and survives. And how does that affect those events? And how do those events now occurring differently and at different times affect every other reality? People like to think of these things, even in the more complicated um, ways, they like to think of them so narrowly, where it's one person or a couple people whose actions change everything. But literally one thing changes everything. Everything, everyone and everything near that thing is changed by the change made to the initial point, which then spreads like a plague until everything has been changed because everything is doing something slightly different now and everything changes. And these changes are infinitely different depending on the action that was changed and how everything else reacts to those changes. And then you have to consider, oh, this one thing could be different. This one thing could have multiple outcomes. Why can't everything have multiple outcomes? Then you have a wide casting ripple of infinitely possible changes that can then infinitely possibly change everything around them. I don't know how the fuck the purple tear got anything done. How the fuck did she manage to become a master swordsman? <laughs> how did she have time? With all of that. I can see why she didn't use her powers much. There's not much point. And also, the key point here, meaning I don't care about the ancillary stuff, she would have to not care about the ancillary stuff. If she cared about the ancillary stuff, she wouldn't do anything. She couldn't do anything. She would be paralyzed by the fact that every decision she makes will lead to, undoubtedly, a fuck ton of bad outcomes, because that's just the nature of, of that ripple. What a shit power to have. I really wouldn't want it. It's powerful, but I wouldn't want it. Not in a million years. I was in no way a soft person, though I don't view myself as particularly tough or rugged either. A straight and honest person, accusations would be brought against me for being unmoved by the death of any person, however close they may have been in life, a point not everyone would see as criticism. How could a person be so cold and heartless, even if the basic bearing of a fixer is to look after oneself first and foremost? At first, I spent much time thinking over it, and asked myself many questions. Zhao as a person valued the lives of her colleagues, though her position forced her to keep her farewell to deceased t teammates short. Since carrying out her duty and emerging victorious came first, shedding fewer drops of tears than the number of fallen was all the tribute I could pay. Bawling my eyes out would have stirred the uneasiness in my colleagues. In the early days, the responsibility sometimes felt too heavy and burdensome. I had never once thought that my method was incorrect. I believed it to be the best method for myself, and I deemed that problems couldn't be solved any other way. Most fixers will probably think the same way. Therefore, I could not understand the manners of Lowell, the newly appointed Section 2 director at the time, a person who tries to look after everyone and doesn't hide his grief-stricken face when a co-worker passes away. It seemed clear as crystal that his tenderness would one day lead to his team to death, yet he was faring better than I thought, a polar opposite to me. The ways I wanted to pursue, but gave up because I was faced with my limitations. It might have upset me for a moment, a principle I could not follow, for I was not allowed to openly express sadness over the death of the few in order to protect the many, and my obligation to seize any chance of victory compelled me to march forward if there was something to count on. 
My capability wasn't vast enough to embrace every member of the team. Was my choice wrong? What did he have that I did not? Looking back, I don't think what I felt was envy or jealousy. The indignation certainly was not a toxic emotion. I'm sure each of us had different specialties. It is said that people intersect with one another in some manner. I don't think the process to be natural at all. I was not a believer of fateful meetings. After all, two parallel roads can never cross. A relationship begins with a desire to know. Simple curiosity. To know more about a person or to go further and see what they are seeing together. People open up new roads to merge into the roads of others for various reasons. I thought I would never care about him since he was so different from me, but my expectations weren't quite right. I wanted to learn more about him, and I wanted to know what this emotion I felt was, and I thought I could perhaps become a better person if I saw what he was seeing together. If there's one thing I realize, it's that relationships between people always start from such small curiosity. Talking in what I have said so far, you would think that this is such a peculiar and untruthful love. You might think it's fussy. I cannot give out a clear answer, for I can't dare define what love is. What could I say or add about an emotion I felt for the first time, one that I am still struggling to figure out? Furthermore, every person carries a different form of love. There will undoubtedly be some people who don't place much importance on that emotion. You might even think that such emotion is absolutely useless in this city. Even if I were to define my love, this wouldn't come across as a sweet story if you cannot understand it. However, I can be certain that my sentiment towards Lowell was sincere. The so-called curiosity and sympathy, they bring about attention, admiration, and a little bit of obsession. I learned soon enough that this isn't much different from what people call love. It may not have been something out of a fairy tale or a drama, but we still cherished each other in our little relationship. Perhaps I had been under the impression that love is a concept that is utterly distant from me. The love that I came into was cramped, yet big, and it felt burdensome at times. You said I am strong, but the truth is that I was weak and faint-hearted until the very last time I faced you. I have only grown so ironclad after I lost you. Why did I miss everything while you were still by my side? Why do I spend the whole night longing for you and regretting only after you have parted from me? I do have one regret regarding you, that I could not trust my feelings for you, that I was too afraid to tell you that you are my everything the night before you left me. Moments of loneliness will come as I live. It won't be a lot of thirsty longing for love, however. It is when I look to my side, yet there is no one next to me. When I am worn out from running somewhere, when I feel that my heart grows heavy rather than painful. Trying new things might let me forget it for a moment, but the memories will still follow me for life. When I feel such things, I can go back to familiarity. A familiar place, a familiar mind, a familiar person, and I plan to reunite with you soon. I want to tell you that I have no longer have shame for the path I've chosen, and that I have finally freed myself from the guilt. So yeah, uh, Xiao didn't take Lowell's death very well. Uh, uh, not very well at all. Um, quite poorly. And like I said last time, I honestly feel that Lowell probably would have taken it just as poorly, if not worse. I feel like that was kind of how the two of them worked once they became an item. But it's nice to know that, spoilers for the end of the game, these two will probably be reunited. Will they be working for the lure, for the lure anymore? I, I don't know. There's a million different stories that can stem from the end of Ruiner. Because we have all of these protagonists that were dead and now they're not dead. They're all just going to die again, aren't they? Next game, they're going to be like, Hey guys, first bit of the game, look, it's Zhao and Lowell and they're fucking dead. Hey guys, check it out, it's our corp. It's all your favorites, it's Maxim and Rudolph and Mio and Nikolai and they're all dead. They've instantly been killed by the new things. The index proxies? Who? All oh, those corpses over there. Yeah, they're dead too. I don't think they're going to do much with it, to be honest. I think it's too complicated to try and write around bringing back all these characters and having them do their own things. Although, it could make it really easy to write the next game because you don't have to come up with new characters. Oh, last one. My throat's nearly packed in, but I can do this. Have you ever seen a glimmer of light when you close your eyes? It's blindingly brilliant at times, and it shakes in an irregular shape at times. The sensation is often called a phosphine. Whenever I close my eyes, the blurry image of a blood-stained carpet appears to me like that optical phenomenon, the beginning of an unpleasant nightmare. Four mannequins that lost a face and an arm each are lying on the carpet, spilling red beads. Another mannequin has its hand on my shoulder. I turn around and look at the loudspeaker in the mannequin's face. I can feel the vibration coming from it, even though I can't hear what it says. But I already know what sound this mannequin is making. The vibration precisely matches the words I remember, and my heart starts beating accordingly. This damned power of recall lost all my good childhood memories to oblivion, yet it brings back such remembrances every time I close my eyes. My response to it is always the same. Take the flower that slipped into my hand and nail it into the mannequin's heart. A beautiful tree in bloom grows from the cracks of the flower made. It's as soft as the hands that caress me, and it's as pretty as the sound that consoled me. And it's as sharp as the noise of that last moment when I was scolded for the first time. Every 
branch that grows from the tree causes a piercing buzz in my ears, and the petals hurt as they brush past my cheeks, as if to make me feel the pain they hold. I stand still like my feet were tied until my body is covered in scars. One, two, black marbles fall from the pain fall from the wounds. How long have I been in this cycle of pain? The nightmares have been with me for a good majority of my life. If I close my eyes, the memory of that time haunts me, and if I open my eyes, a reality I can hardly bear unfolds. I choose to keep my eyes shut because I thought I'd rather deal with the ever-echoing past. At least I won't be visited by new kinds of pain. Prescripts keep coming without a break. The city folk need meet different ends depending on the prescripts they receive, though their fates all share a commonality of cruelty. Their resentment, screams, tears, rage, and death. It's too much for my eyes. I sometimes thought how my life would have been if I stayed as a commoner taking prescripts like them. Maybe I was better off back then. Maybe I should have just died early so I could breathe again as another being. Why did the prescripts give me that order that day? I traced back the nightmares to remember the past. Everything was over and I planned to follow them to death, but I didn't have the courage to end my own life. So I... I picked up the prescripts that I thought would spell my doom at last and read it slowly. All the fresh looking prescript contained was a command to be a messenger. It was pointing toward a beginning, not an end. I couldn't see a single word that said anything about salvation or death. After being numb for a while, I finally tumbled down to the floor and broke into laughter louder than any sound I'd made before. I couldn't help but laugh at my state. I wanted to end my life because of prescripts, and now the prescripts won't even let me do that. Where has my free will run off to? I was frustrated, not even my own life was under my control, for everything relies on the prescripts. Then I'll gladly play along. Even if I can't shatter the prescripts, I could at least make a tiny crack. If I can show the masses that it's possible to oppose the prescripts, something might change. Something has to. It will make a difference. Once I had hope, I could see the way. And once I could see where to go, I had the strength to get up. However, I realized it only just now. What I felt wasn't hope, and that ignoring that prescript and taking my own life as I planned might have been a truer expression of my free will. What is the right way to live a life in this place, I must wonder? I'm not even dreaming of a life that I can be proud of. How does one achieve the feeling that their life is bearable to live, let alone be satisfied with it? I thought I had found an answer to that, but in the end, I couldn't escape the prescripts. The prescripts are the city's will, as it is my will. I've realized my limits. I feel as if I've hit some kind of wall I can't overcome. However, I don't feel all too forlorn and miserable. Maybe there'll be someone who can ride along with the flow rather than break it. It just won't be me. I'm not fit to accomplish such things. So I want someone to find an answer in my stead, and I hope they can tell me that. Tell me how I can enjoy this nightmare. Well, unfortunately for Yan, um, he's not dead anymore. He's back. And, uh, uh, well, the index hasn't gone anywhere. Yeah, we took down those proxies, but there are many more. So, Yan's back. I guess he could just not go back to the Index. He could do that. Then again, if the Index... The, 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 the fucking prescripts themselves might order someone to come capture him or something, so he's probably not going to be safe unless he goes to the outskirts or something. Everyone else here, pretty much, has a chance for a new beginning, right? With their revival from the, um from the library, being restored from being books. Yan does not. Yan's outlook is exceptionally bleak right now. Going back to the city is not a good option for him, and uh, I don't see it ending well. But this feels near enough in line with when I would listen to Children of the City and I'd hear the lyrics. It's like, yeah, this kind of, this is kind of about right. It all, it's quite succinct actually that like you can listen to Will, uh, Children of the City and it does just pretty much explain the uh, thought process, the feelings behind this very eloquently. And also as a funky beat, Yan is very cool. Wish they'd gotten more. I just don't think see things getting any better for them. Uh, yeah, future's looking bleak for Yan. Unless they can join the library or something, which... Can you just walk into the library and join it? I don't know. I don't think it works that way. No one's tried. Roland had to teleport in. And even that went weird, because he had all his limbs blown off, so that was pretty funny. No, it's not looking good for you, Yan. I'm sorry. But, ladies and gentlemen, that is Star of the City complete. My throat is killing me because I forced myself to get through this quickly uh, because there were so many. I tried to talk about them, like, a bit whilst also burning through them as quickly as I could, but I appreciate in some cases it might not have been a, an extensive enough discussion. But, uh, A, like I said, I was trying to get through this in a reasonable amount of time, and B, my throat is killing me right now, so I was all like, all right, let's get through it. <laughs> But we've done it. Next time will be Impuritus Civitatus. Which honestly, I'm quite confident I can get through in one video quite easily. And then after that will be the finale of the Library of Ruiner Book Club. 
when we check out the bad endings and the art book. I don't know how long the art book will be. That might actually be quite long. I'll play it by ear, but at the very least, next time will be Imperator Civitatus, and then after that will be the beginning of the end of the Library of Ruina Book Club. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening. Special thanks to Beep, Adar Sanjeev, Alkir, Honeydew Corporation, Sweet Baby Red, MB Alias, Lord Skellington, Jesse Kitty, Plutonium Pie, Dreamer Ghost, Lepa Lullaby, K-Bub, Magic Owl, The Frostbite, Monsoon, Sawald, Jumping With Joy, Warmasoku, SCP-106A, Namad, and KennyT800 for supporting me on Patreon. Thank you so much, guys, and thank you all so much for watching. I'll keep my closing thoughts to a minimum because I'm actually very rushed for time right now and i've pretty much discussed everything i just need to say just then with everything that's happening next time we'll have uh, a purity civitasis next time and then we'll have the beginning of the end of the book club then i've got another thing planned another law related thing which is not library of ruina planned after the end of the ruina book club and then i don't know where we'll go from there we'll see we'll figure things out but whatever happens next time impurity civitatis will bring it to an end the reverberation ensemble and hana association and i hope i see you there Toodles! Goodbye!